Bowler to come out to church. So awesome. Praise God for that. But uh, yeah, I, I love those guys. I feel like, um, you know, we start that sermon up, they kind of lighten the mood up, and they're usually pretty funny and kind of profound in, in a deep sense as well. But I don't know if you guys caught that, caught that last line, but they said, everything we try to replace Jesus with doesn't last. And it was kind of quick, but uh, I just feel like it was super right on. And uh, I don't know about you, but um, I have personally just been drawing closer to Jesus uh, so much because uh, so much of life has been just stripped away um, because of everything going on. And so uh, I think a lot of people, um, are, including myself, are just being reminded of, of that these past few months. And so, you know, once you start losing things, um, you start going back to the things that uh, really matter. You know, we, we take these things for granted, going out to eat, uh, going to the mall, hanging out with friends. But um, this whole COVID thing going on and all the other chaos and uh, just worldwide, all kinds of stuff. I mean, we, see, we had an earthquake recently. I just so much stuff is uh, going on. But I feel like God really is working in mysterious ways. And I really feel like, you know, he's doing a lot of things in our hearts. He's bringing a revival back in the churches. And, um, you know, unfortunately, but fortunately, he does use hard times um, to really help us to refocus on what's really important in this life. And so today, we're going to conclude our four-part series of celebrating God. And so um, celebrating God for what he has done in the past, what he's going to do in the future, what he's doing in the present. And today we're just going to celebrate God just because he is who he says he is. And so a lot of people may say, you know, they are a certain way. But it's only true if people around them confirm those characteristics. So you can say, you know, you're generous, you can say you're kind, you can say that you're patient, understanding, but what do the people closest to you say about you? Um, I've had the privilege of uh, being a part of a lot of various church planting assessments uh, as a participant and as a helper kind of person, and that is one of the most important questions uh, for the church planting pastor. Anyone can front that they are all that and a bag of chips, but, you know, what does the spouse say about the pastor when he's not around? What do the children say about the father when he's not around? What do previous leaders say about the pastor when they're not around? But God, on the other hand, is who he says he is. But how can we believe this? And, um, I was thinking about this a lot. You know, the Bible is not physically written by God's hands, but God handpicks those who get to write the Bible. And as you may already know, it doesn't just have flashy things to say about God. It, it does have uh, people, um, real stories, you know, questioning him, questioning that he's not God, suggestions from others saying that he's not a good God, and of course, just others just doubt, you know, outright denying that God is uh, real, and they're just rebelling against him constantly. But I feel like this is how you really know that the Bible is real. It's written by others about who God is. And so there are some who have physically been with him, and there are those that have only experienced him through spiritual means. So what people have said about him, that, you know, there's, it's, just, it's all over the Bible, obviously. The whole Bible is filled about you know, descriptions about who he is, but today I just want to spend a little bit of time on this one verse that kind of just scratches the surface of who God is. Um, if you guys have your Bible, I forgot to put it in my PowerPoint, but I'm going to just use this one verse, and for whatever reason, it's just bad, I don't know. I, just, I know that this verse is a lot of times used during Christmas, and that was a Christmas video. I didn't, I just, I, that was just very fitting for what I wanted to talk about today, so forgive me if it wasn't, you know, July material. It's July, right? No, no, June material. End of June material. But um, Isaiah 9, 6 says this. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And so I know many people relate to this verse during Christmas, but I really love the breakdown of these characteristics. And, and so the more you dig into these words, you realize how finite these words are to describe who he is and 
Contrary to say, the, the Bible was not originally written in English. The uh, NIV was not the original version, as some of you may think. Surprise, the original language was in Hebrew. So I'll read that for us in Hebrew. Just kidding. No way. But I do want to explore what the original language's, uh, language uh, words are. And so if you look at these attributes very carefully, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace, we're just going to go through them uh, this morning. And so the first attribute that um, Isaiah uses is wonderful counselor. Now, the original word for wonderful breaks down to Pele, which means miracles, something unusual, miraculous acts. And then the original word for counselor is yoetz, which means to advise, plan, decide, cancel. Now, if you were to put that together, it would be something like, you know, a miraculous decider. So, okay, if he's a miraculous decider, what does that mean to you and me? Now, I don't know about you, but for me, miraculous decider, that, it, that becomes a kind of a, a very advantageous kind of title because... For me, you know, when I'm doing something new, when I'm doing the unknown, I want to look for people to look for wisdom, right? I want to look for people that know more about the subject that I want to know more about. You know, life is full of so many decisions and questions and things that we don't know about. And so I'm, I'm constantly looking to other people that have gone before me and asking them how they did it. Today, it's, it's crazy how many decisions we make, and there have been so many studies done on just the, the topic of decision making, and I, so I found this one by uh, Eva M. Krakow, uh, PhD. She said that there were 35,000 decisions that an adult made in a single day. Crazy. 226.7 decisions on just food alone, and I, I personally think my food ratio is a lot higher, probably like a thousand you know, decisions a day. Nonetheless, if you calculate that you are sleeping seven hours a day, you make roughly 2,000 decisions an hour, or one decision every two seconds. And in contrast, children are lucky, they only have to make about 3,000 decisions a day. Now you may say, that, that's, that sounds crazy, that's, it's impossible, but if you think about it, from the second you wake up, you're like, all right, uh, are you gonna, am I going to continue sleeping, am I going to wake up, am I going to put my contacts, am I going to put my glasses on, am I going to wash my face, uh, how, how, how am I going to do my hair today, if I'm going to do my hair today, what will you be eating, what you will not be eating if the first thing you chose is not available to eat, how you will put on your shoes, how you'll be traveling to work, what you will say, to text or not, to post or not, pick, post a picture of what you just ate, whether to cough in public, whether not to pop, uh, cough in public, to hold it in, how to position your butt so it doesn't get so sore, sitting to such a long sermon. I mean, our minds are just like constantly being bombarded by all these crazy decisions that we make in a day to day. And then seriously, just on a serious more basis, we have these important decisions to make, like what job to take, what to study, should we take that job, should you study, or should you just take that job? Should you marry that person? Am I celibate? Should you buy that house? Should you make things that, should you make that huge move? Should I retire? And it's, yes, of course, everyone's made your decision. Should I eat that donut? And I'm, I'm always down like, yes, you should, of course, eat that donut. <sighs> so many decisions. And so, you know, you may be laughing, but... Sometimes it can be downright exhausting and life debilitating. My wife asks me all the time, you know, what do you want to eat? And I'm just like, I, I, I don't know. I, I, my, my brain is just so fried by the end of the day. Anything, just food. As long as it's not moving, just, just give me food. Uh, the, the, seriously, the number of decisions that we've made today, uh, it, just, it has just multiplied crazy in 50 years. Even just, you know, walking down the cereal aisle, and you're just, am I going to, you know, choose a, a sugary delight? Or am I going to choose something that has for more fiber so I can use the bathroom more effectively lately, uh, later, you know? I, I have constipation, so you know, I, 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 need the, I need the extra fiber, you know? Um, but seriously, the amount of people that are living with anxiety these days, it just keeps going up and up, and it is causing some serious medical problems in people. And so I did a, I did a study. Oh, well, I didn't do a study. Some people at Harvard did a health study, and approximately 25% of Americans are on some form of antipsychotic drug, and it's probably even higher now that COVID-19 is everywhere, these protests are happening everywhere, the economy is taking a downturn everywhere, and there's just so many decisions to make in this new era, and this, they're drastically just going to impact our life with every decision we make, and every decision is important, otherwise we wouldn't even have to make that decision. 
And so John C. Maxwell, you know, he's the, the guru on leadership. This is what he says. He says that life is a matter of choices and every choice you make makes you. Now, I, I, I'm not trying to stress you out this morning, okay? Like, I, I, just, I just want you to know, I'm, I'm just trying to make a point here, that the wonderful counselor that we have, he is kind of in the Hebrew translation, he is a miraculous decider and he helps you make these huge decisions. You know, there have been decisions that I've personally been waiting years to make and it's, it's, I've, been, I've been waiting years because, you know, these things are going to drastically reroute the course of my life. But perhaps, you know, for some of you, including myself, that's what's keeping you from fulfilling your purpose here on earth. Some of us freeze by all it takes is a whisper from the wonderful counselor. I don't know if you guys know uh, the famous preacher Olaf the Snowman. But he said, only the act of true love will thaw a frozen heart. And so if we were to put it into our terms, sometimes only the love of Christ will thaw your heart so you are free to fulfill your God-given purpose here on earth. And so, that, so know that, church. We have supernatural, all-knowing, all-seeing, ever-present knowledge, access to our Lord and Savior. You know, and so that's the, that's the good news for us today. We don't have to live with anxiety. And I know it's completely natural to live with anxiety, and we're all going to have it. And I'm, I can't stand up here as a Christian and say, oh, you know, just because you have God, you're not going to have anxiety, because I, I have a lot of anxiety. But we don't have to hold on to it. We're not created to hold on to this anxiety. It, it kills you literally high blood pressure. It's hard on the heart. It's hard on the lungs. You stroke, et cetera. We're not meant to carry this. And so what do we do with it? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. You guys know this verse, but it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You know, trade in your anxieties, and I'm going to give you this peace. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so God's attributes are for you. And the second attribute is mighty God. Mighty God comes from Gibor. And if you break down mighty God, it, it, it means manly, vigorous, heroic, champion, angel, to be or mix a period, to achieve, to increase, to be strong, prevail, bold, audacious. This word Gibor uh, in mighty, it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a more powerful word. God is a heroic God. God is a championing God. God is a bold God. God is a strong God. You worship an unstoppable God this morning. That's who you worship. He is a prevailing God. He is a winning God. Psalm 24, 8, he says, Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. This imagery, the Lord, he is in battle for you. And so, you know, the Lord is not just this beautiful picture with beautiful golden hair, like, you know, you just, you know that, that picture that everyone has in their household just collecting dust on their walls. He is a Lord in battle for you. He is fighting for you. He is in a war to win it. He is like William Wallace in Braveheart. He is, he is, he is serious about it. He is in battle this world in your battle to help you win your battle. And so this is why, for us, it's really important to make prayer our first option. Because you may have heard it said, ah, you know, all we can do is pray about it now. And I've heard even the, the most, you know, faith-filled Christians, but if you think about that statement, oh, all we can do is pray about it, it just sounds so defeated, right? Is God below the puddle of your tears, or is he above every other name? Is he the king of kings? Is he the God of gods? Is he the Lord of lords? Is he above every name to you? I remind us today, we worship a heroic, championing, 
bold, strong, victorious God. So if you're going to cry, let your tears come after you have prayed, after you've seen the victory, and you're so thankful that he's brought you yet through another battle. And I, and I just want to proclaim to you, church, you are here today, and you've been coming to church this long, you've been following Jesus this long, because you've, you've been victorious through all of these past battles year after year month after month day after day you are here sitting in these seats because god has been faithful to you to overcome these crazy battles in your life god's attributes are for you the third attribute is everlasting father and um, if you break down everlasting father it is ode and av which means an ode comes from lasting future time to walk along together forever and ever, eternal, unending. And Av means father, ancestor, chief. And so if you put these two words together, you would get some rendition of father forever and ever and ever and ever. So God is the father that will never leave you, never forsake you, no matter what decisions you make. Unless you say, you know what, God, I don't, I don't want you in my life. God will not leave you because you were mean to him. He will not leave you even though you yelled at him. He will not leave you because you didn't listen to him. He will not leave you because you did something wrong, even though maybe your earthly father will do that. People will let you down, but God never will. It's just against his character. Instead, your God, my God, the one we worship, he is with you forever and ever, forever into all eternity. Your earthly fathers may have, have, may have abandoned you, hurt you, chose others before you, abused you, cheated you, but you need to know that this everlasting God is for you, with you, fighting for you, and with you forever and ever. Can I get an amen in your heart? He is with you forever and ever. You know, for me, I, I grew up in the church. I, I, you know, I spent every single, almost every single day at churches. You know, my parents had choir practice, they had elder meeting, deacon meeting. So they, you know, I, I come to church all the time. And so I knew all the Christian words and verses, and I knew how to act Christian, and I knew to what to wear and, and how to act all Christian. But uh, after I left church, I knew that... Uh, if I wanted to, you know, be cool with everybody else, I, I had to pretend like I didn't know God. And in college, I really wanted to be cool. And so I kind of just put him to the side. And I just decided, you know what? I don't want to be acquainted with him right now because that would make me look really uncool. How after some, how after, however, like after, you know, years of just not being with him, and I just realized, you know what? I got it all wrong. Life was just completely meaningless and empty about him. It was just living for today and, you know, getting all this stuff so that I could be happy. But I realized at the end of the day, you know, God is so cool that he was, be, he was, he was cool enough for me being too cool for him. He was so cool that he didn't stop loving me even though I was too cool for him. He didn't diss me because I dissed him. And as, as soon as I realized this, as soon as I got back to him, we left off right where we left off, and he was not, you know, like, you know, yelling at me because I left, but he was forgiving, he was understanding, and he forgot about everything I did, opened his arms, and brought me back in. And so this morning, I want to encourage anybody in this room, if you have left God for a while, he is waiting for you with arms wide open. You may have dissed him. You may have said, oh, you're not my God anymore. However, he is your father forever and ever. This is because he, this is, this is his attribute. God's attributes are for you. He is your everlasting father. And the last attribute that we're going to go through this morning is Prince of Peace. And uh, this last attribute of this verse it breaks down to the prince, it breaks down to Saul, and it means representative of the king, official, commander, district leader, person of note, head. He's the first, you know, he's the higher being, he's a, he's a guardian angel. The, the reason that this author chooses to use prince is because the prince is an authority of his position. 
And sometimes, you know, we limit this idea of a prince to those who are super good looking from, you know, Disney movies, you know, AKA Prince Charming, Aladdin, whatever it is. But a prince has the authority and position to represent the king. And it's a very unique position of power because his father is the king. He is able to deliver what the father has. And so peace, on the other hand, it comes from shalom. And as you guys probably already know, shalom, it means peace, prosperity, success, welfare, state of health, friendliness, deliverness, deliverance, salvation, to be complete, ready, remain healthy, unharmed, to finish, to carry out, tranquility. You know, um, some of you may have uh, seen this quote before. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. And so, uh, I'm, I, I don't know, maybe you've uh, seen this before, but if you, if you think about it, uh, this is actually pretty profound. Since uh, peace comes from God, you, you don't have peace unless you know him. And so if you were to break down these words, right, if you were to break down these words together and, and you put it back together in, a, in a, a different wording from the Hebrew, it could be something like commander of prosperity and tranquility. But I don't know. I think Prince of Peace does sound better in this word. But if you keep on, if you, if you read this, um, I don't know. Sometimes I, I feel like I discount Prince and, you know, I just think of Prince Charming or something, you know, walking in a room with a big smile, with the golden hair again, you know. But he is, he's much more than that. Your God, my God, he delivers peace. He commands peace. He gives us peace. And so right now, 2020, this world, it's full of chaos, confusion, unrest, stress, worry, anxiety, you name it. But you and I can take heart of this Prince of Peace, this commander and chief of prosperity, and give him our unrest and replace it with his peace. God's attributes are for you. That's what Isaiah 9, 6 is talking about today. God's attributes are for you. God is for you. And so I just want to hope, I just want to close the message. And all I really wanted uh, this message to do was to enlarge our vision of God because Sometimes the English words, they just, they're not descriptive like the Hebrew language. And, you know, as I broke down these words, it was a lot more descriptive of what these words mean. And some, sometimes, you know, the 18 inches from your head to your heart, it takes, you know, just a little bit more understanding of what these words mean in a deeper way. And so I just want to remind you guys, you worship a miraculous decision maker. You worship a warrior in battle. You worship a father who is for you forever and ever. He will never give up on you. And lastly, you worship a commander and chief giving you peace always and forever. So I just want to close with that. Um, let's pray this morning. <sighs> Jesus, um, I know that this uh, word was so short and so quick. But Lord, Holy Spirit, you go before us. You are here and that you are here presently with us. You promise when two or more gather in your name, you are here. And so God, with everything going on in this world, job loss and death, things that we took for granted are just being taken away from us every single day. Lord, we give our focus and our worship back to you. God, thank you that you get to use this hardship and this pandemic and this chaos and it's like, God, I don't know what to do to bring us back to you. Because seriously, we were being so spoiled. Spear, uh, just spoiled with provision, spoiled with protection, spoiled with just not having to worry about anything. But because this world has taken such a downturn and we can't depend on the stuff that we used to, uh, used to depend on, God, we're coming back to you. And so this morning, God, um, as we respond to this last song and
our people, we open up our hearts and we worship you, Lord. Um, I just pray that these words will resonate in our heart, that our vision and our, and our, imagine, our imagination of who you are, it grows, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We worship a larger God today. In Jesus' name. Every day out of the 35,000 decisions that we make every single day. And um, the decision is you can continue to view Jesus as that wall portrait, a wall portrait, collecting dust with the beautiful golden hair looking. Or you can remember that God is a warrior fighting for you in battle every day. You know, honestly, as a preacher, for whatever reason, you know, just weeks that I have to preach, I encounter all kinds of just crazy things, um, and some people may call it spiritual warfare or coincidence, but I, I, I kind of do think it's spiritual warfare because, you know, obviously Satan doesn't want me to preach God's word, and so, man, uh, car breaking down, my cell phone shattering, you know, my wife getting sick, and my computer break. I mean, this is all in like one week. It's just, it was insane. But know that Satan is just a pain in the butt. That's all he is. You don't have to fear him because God is way, way, way above him. Amen? And so God bless you guys. Have a victorious week. He is the King of kings, Lord of lords, name of, name, name of all names. Amen.